Hi folks, welcome to Greg's Workshop. I'm Greg and today we're going to be talking about home backup generators. Why do you need a standby generator? Well, maybe you live in an area that has a lot of natural disasters where the power goes out regularly or if it goes out occasionally, it goes out for many days at a time. Uh, where we live, the power doesn't go out very much, but we had an ice storm about a year and a half ago. Uh, knocked out the power for 36 hours. I'm glad that we had a generator set up and I'm going to... There are three main ways that you can have backup power generation for your house. Number one, portable generator, extension cords run out to whatever you need powered. Number two, generator running to a transfer switch panel that switches individual circuits in your house. And number three, having a whole house generator, usually with an auto transfer switch. Let's go over each one in detail. System number one is a portable generator with extension cords. If you're gonna go this route, make sure this is at least 2000 and preferably 3000 watts. Make sure that you have your extension cords and your runs and what you're gonna plug in pre-planned. Do the math on how much energy they take. You can find those calculators online. Refrigerators use quite a bit of power. If you have a chest freezer, you don't actually need to run it that much. Even in a normal day, it only cycles on a few times a day. Chest freezers are very efficient. Uh, they will, as long as they're full of food and, and product and thermal mass, they'll stay cold and frozen for quite a while. Second is the transfer panel system. So you have a generator, you plug it into the panel, an outlet on the out, or inlet, I guess, on the outside of the house. You have a panel next to your breaker panel, and that's pre-wired for individual circuits. So maybe your freezers, your kitchen, your furnace, so on. Last is the whole house system. These are usually 10 kilowatt generators, 12, 15. They often come with an automatic transfer switch. They're usually tied into either the natural gas supply, your home's propane supply, or they have their own diesel tank. We generally, in generators, try not to run gas. Uh, gas goes bad if you've ever had a lawnmower that you didn't properly winterize the, the fall before and you pull it out in the spring and it's hard to start. You don't want that with your generator. If you do go with gas, be sure and use ethanol-free gas and use a fuel stabilizer and drain or run the tank dry every time you use it. So those are your three basic options. What we have, we've chosen the middle option, we have a portable generator that's outside in a shed. We have the panel mounted in the basement next to the breakers. This will switch individual circuits. It works really well for us. Let's go take a look. Here's the generator I have. It's an 8,000 watt Briggs & Stratton. I got it used off Craigslist. I got it for a really good price because the fuel tank was missing and it cracked and broken which was fine with me because I was gonna convert it to uh, run off of natural gas and propane anyway, so good enough. Starting on the left-hand side of my generator shed, we have the cooling air intake right here. This is the gas hose that runs over to our gas meter. This is the power output. This is where I plug the cord in to get generator power to the house. On the inside, you can see the generator itself. It's on wheels, it can be moved, although it's a few hundred pounds, so it's kind of tough to do. Back here in the back is the regulator for the gas. You can see that little bolt there. You have to adjust that whether you're using natural gas or propane because they have different uh, energy densities. You can see the cord running over here, plugs into the generator. Over here you can see an exhaust fan plugged into the generator as well. So that comes on just automatically as soon as I fire up the generator. For exhaust, I have this triple wall pipe here, just right turning an elbow and exiting in front of the fan. It actually works really well. It keeps the wall cold or cool, uh, gets the exhaust gases out, works pretty well. And on the outside, I just have an automatic louver cover. Two other things. One, you'll notice the fuel filter and the valve right there. I did plumb this to run off of gasoline. It's actually set up to hook into my uh, boat tank. So if I do need to run off gasoline, if the natural gas goes out, we run out of propane, um, I can hook up to that. And then the, the big yellow thing is the power cord. That's a 30 amp, 240 volt cord. We'll plug it into the outside of the shed here and plug it into the house. And uh, that sends power into our transfer panel. First, we plug the power cord into the outlet on the generator shed. Next, we plug the cord into the house. Last, we plug the gas into the gas meter. Now that we have the cord and the gas hooked up, we need to turn on the gas, then come over to the generator and prime it with gas. On the back of the regulator, there's this little tiny button. You push, 
we can hear gas running. Let that go for about 10 seconds or until we can smell gas. Then give it a pull. In my installation, you can tell that it's producing power because the fan comes on. It looks like it's spinning pretty slow in that video. That's just the frame rate. I can assure you it's spinning at full speed. With the generator running, we can come down to the panel. This is our transfer switch panel. Up top here, you can see I have all the circuits numbered to match what's in the main panel over here, as well as named. To switch them from line, which is the power coming in, to gen, we take the switch, flip it up all the way. In the middle is off, that disconnects the circuit entirely. So let's see here, let's do basement outlets, and uh, let's do basement lights. Just like that. Up here, you can see we have a meter. So this is a 240 volt generator powering this panel with 240 volts. 240 volts isn't actually 240 volts. It's two separate 120 volt leads. So this is one half of the generator. This is the other half of the generator. And this is true for all 240 volt generators and for that matter, the power coming into your house. You wanna make sure that neither one of these gets above the capacity of the generator. If one of them gets really high and the other gets really low, that can damage the generator. So you wanna make sure that that electricity is balanced between the two halves. You can see each of these circuits also has its own breaker. So when we switch it to generator, it bypasses the breaker in the main panel and this becomes the breaker. So if we have this switch, this is the basement lights. If for some reason that becomes overloaded, it's gonna trip this breaker, not the one in the panel. Over here you can see we have a 240 uh, 30 amp circuit. Our house actually has a sub panel in the upstairs so that one uh, paired circuit can power the entire upstairs, all three bedrooms and the bathroom in our house. That's just the way our house is wired. Uh, it's kind of convenient for this sort of thing. You can also see this cutout right here. If you want to, you can put the power inlet right here. You can pull it out of that box, mount it right in here, and, uh, and like for instance if this was out by your garage door or something. When you put in a panel like this, you need to figure out uh, what circuits you want to run off of it. So life safety, food preservation, things like that are the most important. So here we have, uh, like I said, the uh, upstairs. Um, we have kitchen outlets so we can cook. We have basement outlets, excuse me, basement lights so that we can see down here. We have outside outlets uh, just in case we need to do anything outside, clean up, you know, clean up the yard or whatever. Uh, the refrigerator obviously food preservation. Back porch outlets, which used to be where our freezers are, although they're in the basement now. Uh, the furnace, we have a gas furnace, so if we have gas service to run the generator, we have gas service to run the furnace and keep us warm. Uh, living room lights for a little livability, and then our basement outlets to keep our uh, freezers cold. One side benefit of having this as opposed to a whole house system or the extension cords um, is that you will automatically know when the power comes back on because I've only chosen some of these circuits. So there's lights in the house and outlets in the house that will just magically come back on when the power comes back on. So let's say that that happened. We haven't actually lost power, but let's say that we did and it came back on. So we just take all these switches, put them down the line. Then we go upstairs uh, out in the yard and we turn the generator off. Let's talk about installation for a bit. I'm not an electrician, I'm a homeowner, but I'm reasonably skilled at home household electrical. I installed that panel myself. In fact, I've installed that panel twice. I installed it once in my old house, then I took it out, brought it to this house to install it here. Second time is a little bit easier. If you're not comfortable doing it yourself, if you don't think that your skills are that good or that you can take them that far, by all means, hire a professional to do it. But a professional will probably charge three hours because that's about how long it takes to get all that done. So you can save some money if you just follow the instructions. Um, let's talk about permits for a minute. I did get a permit for that, uh, and it was an expensive permit. That's classified in our city as a feeder, so it's the same as if we were getting a brand new service into the house. Um, I don't really like getting permits, they're kind of a pain. Uh, when the inspector showed up, he basically just said, well, does it work? And I said, yeah, and he goes, okay, good, and he signed it off. 
kind of silly. Uh, the reason to get permits though is for your insurance. If the house burns down, you have some electrical work in the house that you did that you don't have a permit for, your insurance might not pay. Quick little interjection here. This is a CO detector. I have an umbrella room throughout the house. This is an important safety feature in general, but especially when you're running a generator. I bought one with a digital readout so we can tell if the CO is starting to go up before it gets to alarm level, we know that we need to fix the problem. So that's a quick overview of the three types of generator setups, as well as the, an example of the one that we have, the one that we've chosen for our house. What about you? Do you have a generator? Do you have maybe the system with extension cords? Do you maybe gone whole hog and went for a, a whole house system? They're expensive, but they're nice. Do you have any questions? Is there anything else you'd like me to take a closer look at, do another video on? If so, let me know in the comments down below. If you like the video, hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell to get notified of new videos every Saturday morning, leave a comment or question down below, and I'll see you next week on Greg's Workshop.